I would say that there is nothing to talk about about me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Um, just some disclaimer. Um, I've, I've talked to a few of you so far, and you probably you know got a, an idea of my personality. Uh, when I'm presenting, you know, I put on a mask. So that mask is really just like a, a guy who's a little bit more sarcastic and try to make jokes just to emphasize that you guys can actually um, never forget what I said. Um, there will be things that I will say that it, you guys may not know technology-wise, and that's precisely the plan. I want to, you, you know, make sure that after you leave this room, you'll be smarter than when you came in. So in order to do that, I definitely need to, uh, you know, talk about things that you have never heard before. But for everything that I will talk about, I'll give you at least the value proposition and some context so you know what it's for. So after that, you can, you know, go back home and Google all of that, right? And last but not least, even though I say I don't care, I do care, you know, when you guys leave the room. It makes me feel really, really bad, so please don't do it unless you have to, but in case you have to, please do, right? And uh, without further ado, let's, you know, talk about that. So, my name is Paulo Almeida, I'm a solutions architect at Rome, which is a small to medium <coughs> IT consultancy here in New Zealand, not far away from here. And today I'm here to talk about zero downtime operating system patching, but most importantly, to answer the question of how does AWS do that? which is kind of a interesting in a way that I never really understood that about technology, you know, IT people. We believe that everything else that's done by big companies is good, is fantastic, and everything else that we do is crap, right? But on the other side, we also believe that everything else that other, you know, competitors of ours do is horrible. So it's, it's kind of hard, you know, because we're in the worst of the, the, the both worlds. We don't trust ourselves, but you just believe that the big companies can do the right thing. So when you basically, you know, take a peek at what's behind the scenes, you can realize that these things are actually very real. So, so let's see how that goes, right? So don't throw tomatoes at me, okay? That's very important. <laughs> uh, so this is what you can expect from this session. Uh, we're going to talk about the history of patching the problem, which AWS services you can use to achieve, you know, zero downtime patching, uh, some patching strategies, and, you know, the big question, so I'm going to, you know, make sure that you, you guys stay until the end to tell you that, and last but not least, the Q&A, all right? So, without further ado, how patching came to be. So, all right, let me, let me ask you one question. Raise your hand if you were alive before 1940. There we go. That's, that's precisely what I want to talk about. So, this is one of you know, the, the you know, first computer programs that we used to have, and that's a, a program written for a computer in 1944. That's a punch card. And the term patching was precisely, precisely like a band-aid that you would put on top of those holes to basically either erase a mistake you've made when you're putting, uh, you know, punching the card, or to basically, you know, tweak some of the instructions to change the behavior of the program that you had back in the day. But because they were not connected to the internet for obvious reasons, uh, they were mostly used for fixing problems in terms of operations, right? And, and of course, this changed over time. But there are certain things that I want you guys to really, you know, pay attention. So there are numbers at the bottom of each sheet, and even though you can't really see that, there are you know little numbers you know at the top of each line as well. So you would receive from you know the software manufacturer like a, a, a manual that would tell you where to apply those patches, and the patches would be you know this little black block, black you know band aid, and that's how patching actually you know created. And please don't make the mistake. This has nothing to do with the expression to patch things up with someone. There has nothing to do with that. But this has changed from patching physical, uh, you know, cards of you know paper to that. But interestingly enough, we still have some of the references as well. So we still have to say in which file and also in which line we should actually apply, you know, those corrections. So it hasn't changed much. And you know, IT is very well known from getting things that exist in the real world 
and basically translating that into things that we can do on the computer, but they still exactly the same. But in order to get access to that, what you do is running the update command of whatever uh, operating system package management tool you prefer. So choose your, you know, your poison right there. And uh, you get like a, um, a list of what, which things can be updated, and you simply get to say yes or no. That's simple, right? So that's problem solved, right? And here's the thing I will tell you about presentations. Whenever there is a question in the presentation, you can reasonably say no, or answer no, and still be right. So, of course, we all know that the answer is not quite yet. It's not, the problem is not solved. And this is where the problem comes into play. And be aware, this is an oversimplification, otherwise you guys would stay here for a week. But um, I will basically get the basic, basic elements of the modern computer and try to tell you how we actually, how we execute a program and why the abstraction layer that we built over the years is preventing us from doing patching the way we want to do, right? So whenever you need to run a new program, the OS will actually go to the file system and say, hey, load the file. That file will basically contains the instructions that needs to be executed, right? So it gets that and pushes to the memory of the RAM, right? We all know that, no, no, no points for guessing. But it pushes everything that we need to, because the CPU doesn't understand a thing about file systems. It understands about how to access memory, and that's it, through the use of registers. So after it's, it's done, at a certain point, the OS will tell the CPU via the scheduling mechanism which program will run at a certain point. And, and it will tell the CPU, hey, CPU, you know this, you know, memory address, go to this memory address and basically execute whatever is in that. That's precisely how it works. And uh, it's supposed to not working well. Okay. And once this happens, which I just told you, everything works fine. But what happens if you apply a patch on the file system? You're just changing what's, what's written on the hard disk. Unless it's specifically needed, the OS will never go back to the file system, read the file again, and try to map what, it, what is in the memory and what you have already patched, or what you have in, in the disk. Because doing that crisscross of information is first time consuming, and second, it, is, it will create a big, a very big security hole. Very one, a very big one. So it doesn't do that. And to make things worse, we have other mechanisms like, you know, memory that's not being used gets moved to the disk again because you know we need to free memory we use com programs that requires more memory than we actually have and all of those solutions they were built, they were put on top of one another but at a certain point they are creating this very m massive and complicated situation that prevent us from doing patching on a running program so if that, if that explanation is like, oh, Paolo, that's too much, I didn't understand a thing, you are in the right place. Please don't go away. So, imagine a memory. Imagine that we try to solve that. I know we, 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 are, we have a, a smart audience and you guys are already thinking like, hey, Paolo, maybe there is a way to fix that problem. I can see it. So let's walk, walk through that idea. So imagine a memory, and I'm, I have a picture of a memory to help you guys you know, imagine that. And, uh, in the memory, you're going to have a bunch of blocks that will sit in that. But this is the thing about memory. Memory doesn't know anything about your program. It knows numbers. But the definition of what's the code that will run, or where you basically store the variables, or where basically you're going to you know, store the references of which function your, your code must return to once your function finishes its work, it's also stored in the memory, but it doesn't have a, you know, a specific you know, instruction that says, oh, this number relates to x, y, and z. It's all numbers. So after it goes to the memory, you don't know what is what, right? Which means that when you actually apply a patch, you are just changing that section there, which is the code section. And everything else is actually not touched. And this can create big, big problems, 
right? I'm going to show you one example in which this can be catastrophic. And that's also an oversimplification, but just to emphasize that you guys get why. So imagine that we have in the memory a variable that contains two properties. One is called name, which has you know, the value AWSAKL. The other one has a pointer to a function. But someone out there discovered that they could essentially you know, tweak, tweak you know, the, the contents, contents sent to that particular variable, and this would cause a security flaw. We have one of these every single day, right? But in order to fix that, we have to basically change the structure to not only contain the other two variables that we had, but also a third variable, which is the access control list. But here's the problem. The previous variable had, let's say, eight bytes of space. Now this one will consume 12. What will happen is, at a certain point, if this was even a possibility to happen, in the memory, you would have to basically push everything that was right next to your variable somewhere else and update all the references to all the program, programs running on the computer at, at that point. If that's where the problem happens, because this is a lot of math to do. But most importantly, no operating system would allow you to do that, because it would also mean that you have access to change all their programs' behaviors. And we don't, we don't trust that. In fact, we do everything within our power to isolate applications from one another to the best of our abilities, because we don't trust somebody else's application. So this will never happen because of the way we write operating system nowadays. This may change because operating systems come and go, and one day Linux is not going to be a thing. It's not going to be maybe in our lifetime, but at a certain point, we need to evolve to different, you know, uh, our, our Tetris to different paradigms, and this might be a thing we want to take a look at, right? But right now, this is not possible. I'm sorry to burst a bubble, all right? But this is as close as you can get to a hotchpot, okay, if you do that. Uh, so lessons learned so far, and I really want you to memorize that. No reboot means no patch. Plain and simple, and probably painful as well. Okay? So if anyone tells you otherwise, that person is lying. That person is trying to sell you something which is not going to meet your expectations. Don't fall for, for that trap. Okay, we're all on the same page? Sweet? But here comes a controversy. Right? A controversy, sorry. What about Linux uh, kernel live patching? And uh, have you guys seen that, that video before? No? Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. All right, I need 60 seconds. Oh, hi, man. I need 60 seconds of your time to make you feel proud, confused, and ashamed at the same time. Only 60 seconds, okay? Bear with me. Oh. Okay, you guys will have to read the lyrics, I'm sorry. It's the uptime fun. Uh, up time fun. Can you guys hear that? I'm so sorry. I'm sorry, I thought it was louder. <laughs> Don't call him. <laughs> Please don't. Okay, we're all feeling ashamed now. <laughs> there is a lot to unpack there. There is a lot to unpack there. Okay, let's start with you know the basic things. All right. So the first one, if you are taking a coffee and your manager has to go to you to show a computer that something which was supposed to be mission critical is not working and you don't know about that, you know you have something, some work to do on the monitoring system. So please 
do that. The second thing, and also very important, if you are dealing with a mission critical system, please have someone with a pager. You can't let that happen. You know, you have time to to, you know, to meet. That's called SLA and SLO. I'm sorry, you have to do it. And third and most important, this is I know this is a parody, but this is a parody created by SUSE, one of you know the most you know well known enterprise Linux distributions out there. There are certain you know billion dollar software that only runs on SUSE because that's where the support is not rendered void. One example, SAP, right? And uh, when you put it this way. They are sending the wrong message, a very misleading message, right? Because you would never be able to make the, the, the hot patch happen seamlessly without really, really taking care of what's happening. In fact, when you apply a patch, you have instructions that you have to do in order to make sure that first, the patch has been applied and it is, it is in execution. And second, most importantly, if things go wrong, you have to revert the patch. It's not something you can do automatically. So don't reboot and just patch. It's the terrible message they're sending and I'm here to you know, dismystify that. So in order to do that, let's talk about how it works. I don't want you to understand everything which is written in here, but I want you to know some important stuff. So. The old function is the function that's actually not good enough to be executing. We want to patch that. So basically what it does is instead of actually oops, sorry, instead of actually um, changing the reference of where that particular uh, um, function is living, it basically changes the content and adds a jump that goes to the new function, right? This is important, and this can only happen because in the kernel space, you're not isolating kernel from the kernel. Kernel has access to all the memory in the kernel, so it's a thing that's possible there, but not possible for user applications, which is what we do, right? Another thing which is very important to emphasize here, and I really want you guys to take a look at a certain point, is this technology here called F-Trace. It stands for function trace, or, you know, it depends on how you look at that. But, this was initially created for dynamic debugging. So, which is essentially to get information of what is running in your system without actually adding instruction, you know, logging statements. This is really a thing. So, have you guys heard of BPF before? BPF? Raise your hand if you have heard before. Okay. It's roughly the same thing. So, no, okay. It's not roughly the same thing, but it has, you know, the same idea in terms of the dynamic debugging. But the thing is, what I want to emphasize here is that sometimes technology which was meant to be used in one way are so versatile that it takes someone else to basically imagine that in a different context and do something you know, relevant. But it's still, there is one limitation here that we cannot escape from. Most patches, they are more about checking or you know, adding conditional statements, checking whether or not the program should be doing that because in the past it was doing naively, but now you need to check whether or not this is not a, you know, a, an actor, a bad actor that, you know, executed something that was not supposed to, right? But this is not the only case. There are certain patches which will change how the function works and how many parameters it can take. In this case, live patching is not a possibility. So what we learned about that is the following. First, kernel, is, uh, kernel live patching is possible. Second, it is possible only if you don't change the method signature. And third, in, in this moment, most importantly, someone needs to write this. Who of you has an experience of writing kernel patches? Please raise your hand. Exactly. It's not easy. And you are not going to do that alone. So, how people actually do it? So. This big enterprise Linux, they cannot sell the kernel because the license says they cannot do it. But the patches that they apply for, that they, you know, they create the craft specifically for live patching is not part of the kernel. It will be applied in the kernel, but it's not part of the kernel. So the price you pay for them is specifically about the time it takes for a developer to, you know, create that, test that, and say, hey, here you go, if you need to patch, go for that. And even without that, even with that, you don't have any guarantees that this is not going to break anything. 
this is very important to say, right? But in all of them, this is paid. Surprisingly enough, for Amazon Linux, this is not paid. So if you needed an additional reason why to use Amazon Linux, now I'm going to tell you some of them. So the first one is it runs smoothly on uh, AWS EC2. Second, it is rock solid, let's be honest. Third, it contains all the drivers, or most of the drivers, that would allow your machine to actually move between instance types, which are different hardwares after all, with, in most cases without changing a thing, which is beautiful. And now you have a better one. You don't have to pay for kernel life patching because they craft those patches for you, right? But it comes with a cost, and that's not a monetary cost. It's a cost of how do we actually see that? First, this is not enabled by default because it's dangerous. We all agree with that. It is dangerous, it can break stuff. If something breaks in the kernel, there is no exception. There is going down. That's the only thing that can happen. Um, second, the, num the vulnerabilities, they are only cr eligible to, to be used as a potential flaw to be eventually, you know, a patched by, you know, the, the, or created by the, the, the EC2 Linux kernel team if the, the, if the score, the CVS score, is 7 or higher. So if you don't know, you know, all the, you know, the, 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 the grades, oh, I can tell you that 7 and higher is between high and critical. So a median uh, 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 vulnerability is not good enough to, you know, to put your whole system at risk. So that's the second cause. And third, and that one is my favorite, because it tells people what, it, what this is for. AWS provides a kernel life patches for an Amazon Linux 2 kernel version for up to three months after its release. After a three month period, you must update to a later kernel version to continue to receive kernel life patches. That imposes a hard limit. You're not gonna have a system that should be uh, operating for more than three months. If someone, apparently there is a trend on the internet that has always been there that people post the uptime of their machines. When they say, wow, it's been up, you know, up for 10 years, my mind is not like, wow, how stable that is. It's, oh, for God's sake, you didn't do anything. You haven't learned anything. That, that, that's really how I see that picture. Three, three months or more, you are doing something wrong. And the bottom line, and that's the one I, can, I cannot let you guys forget, life patching is not, and I repeat, is not a solution for no reboot. It is a solution for a delayed reboot option. So... We all, we all know that all systems must have a maintenance window. They all have. Oh, but my system's highly available. You must have. It's important that you have, okay? This, is, this has absolutely nothing to do with RPO or RTO, which is specifically for disaster recovery things, but you must have a maintenance window to be used when you need to. But what I'm trying to say is that sometimes there is a, a vulnerability which is so big and so you know, threatening that you are far away from your maintenance window in order to apply that. So, a kernel life updating is an option. In that case, and only in that case. That's the train of thought I need you guys to follow, okay? Uh, now I'm talking about AWS. Well, I haven't talked about a single AWS thing, and that's the AWS Meetup group. I'm so sorry, guys. So, which services we can use to achieve zero downtime patching? And in here, another disclaimer, there's a lot of services out there. I had to choose a few, and I only have one hour to tell everything. So, I will probably gloss over a few of them, but I will tell you the value proposition as a grid. So, let's break those services into two big categories. AMI creation and deployment tools. In terms of AMI creation, you can either uh, use open source you know, solutions like HashCorp Packer, which used to be my favorite for a long time, but you can use you know, AWS specific ones, like the EC2 Image Builder. Raise your hand if you have used uh, EC2 Image Builder before. Nice, that's good, that's good. All right, we, I, I want to highlight a few things about that. So the first one, It's free, and I like it. I really like it. Trust me, I like it. But it's free in the sense that if you if you needed to have a machine that creates an, another machine and configures everything else, you would spend time. And, and uh, 
that is computing power. You're not paying that. You are paying for you know the services that basically will be used to store the you know the, the final result, like the EBS snapshot. But the price is negligible. Let's be honest. And so it's essentially free. Let's call it virtually free, which is the nomenclature we use. Uh, supports reusable recipes for both installation and testing components. Raise your hand if you have used configuration management tools like Ansible or Chef. Ah, nice, beautiful. So, for you to wrap your head, up, um, uh, you know, wrap your head around how EC2 Image Builder works is going to be a piece of cake because, in the case of Ansible, you can run Ansible things there, right? So you can test not only if things are installed, but also if things can actually, you know, boot up and you know not generate any error when you know starting up the application. <coughs> This is hard to do in Packer, we all know that, but it was, you know, really dumbed down by AWS, I would say. I, I think that it is worthwhile, you know, to test that. But one of my favorite, this is not AWS specific. So we tend to believe that a free thing that runs on AWS should only be available for AWS stuff, but in this case, it also supports other output formats like OVF, Open Virtual Format. Basically, you can import that anywhere anywhere because it's an open standard, right? So this is really a you know, differentiator. Uh, and I'm not sure if that's a highlight, but for me it was weird. That's the only service I couldn't find a logo, apparently. So please AWS you for watching that. Change the logo, okay? Uh, deployment tools. And now I will make you guys cringe. That was my favorite moment. Okay, raise your hand if you use Terraform. Okay. Raise your hand if you use CloudFormation. Okay, same group of people. That's unexpected. Raise your hand if you use Pulumi. Okay, you use everything, eh? That's so cool. Um, how, now is the bigger question. Raise your hand if you started doing something in CloudFormation, it got out of, it, out of control, really hard to maintain, and all of a sudden you, you, you realize that Oh gosh, my whole stack is drifted. And you, you got burned by CloudFormation. Okay, a few examples. There we go. Don't feel, don't feel ashamed. We all have done that. Uh, that is true. CloudFormation is an option. And uh, it's not like, oh, this is in an AWS uh, um, uh, meetup group, so I'm only going to talk about AWS stuff. I think that CloudFormation in this particular context is fantastic because. Yes, it can get hard, it can get complex, and in comparison to Terraform, it doesn't do a lot of things well, right? But CloudFormation does one thing that, with the exception of some new tools I've seen recently, no other tool can actually do given their abstraction layers, which is the ability of rolling back in case things, you know, you know went wrong, <coughs> but roll back to the original state that you agreed with. And if you use CloudFormation in, in, in its very minimalist way, in which you don't rely a lot on that, just very small components, I can guarantee you, you it will basically be your best friend. So let's take a look at you know, one, of, one of the scripts I personally use. So I removed that, otherwise it wouldn't you know, fit on the screen. So we know that you have parameters and the resources. But the important part here is that I only have two resources in my CloudFormation template. <coughs> is the launch configuration and the off-scaling group. Everything else, network, application, database, secrets, uh, you know, uh, compliance, lambdas, is not there. So with those two, we can be happy, okay? But let's, you know, take a little bit deeper into that. So in the case of parameters, I only care about the instance type and the AMI. That's all I care. Because the AMI will have to change by the, the, the patched you know, server that I created. And the instance type, I think it's, it's an important value to, 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 to have in that, but you could, you could get away with that if you want. And the resources, it uses the, the, those particular variables, but I want to dig a little bit deeper into the old scaling group. That's where the magic really is. And um, allow me to show this. Have you guys used the update policy of any resource on CloudFormation before? Yes. Here's the thing. With that statement here, I can configure how 
how, how, <coughs> how much I can actually predict how and what CloudFormation will actually do. Because I'm telling, look, make sure you don't remove all the, the, all the, the instances there. I need at least one instance in service. Please make sure you don't update you know, more than one instance at the same time. Please make sure that there is a timeout between executions. Please make sure that all of the other processes that can change my uh, old scaling group configuration are not competing against this deployment. And this thing, if you were to write that, either in Terraform, if that's even possible, or even write that from scratch, because it's called Amazon Web Service for a reason. It's because everything is in a web service and you can you know, basically create a, a script that does that. It would take you a long time to do it. It would take a long time to do it. And here, it's really just like 10 lines. The one thing I, I want you guys not to forget and at any point during this presentation is that this is just one of the small configurations that must play in harmony with all of the other you know, services that we will have in this architecture in order to get to the final result, which is the zero uh, downtime deployment. This is a very important one. Don't forget about this one and make sure that the, the, the timeouts you set here are reasonable. There are many, many other things you can use here, but this is the simplest one. Code pipeline. How many of you have used code pipeline? Yeah, nice. Okay, here's the thing. I think this is the most underrated AWS service, and that's my personal opinion. Uh, the reason for that is because most people that I've talked to, they believe code pipeline is a glamorized cloud native service that competes, competes against Jenkins. And that's wrong in so many ways. But I can see why people came to that conclusion for. It can do things that Jenkins can do. Not everything, but it can do some of the things it does. But in our case, the value proposition that I want you guys to remember is it plays nicely with CloudFormation. Or, yeah, with CloudFormation. And this, we will take, you know, uh, we take advantage on that. So, this is one of, one of the scenarios that you can actually build. So I have a known, I know it's really small, but I'll tell you this. So I have one stage that deploys my new AMI to the known production environments, in which, of course, after they are all uh, um, deployed and up and running, I can, if I'm really risk averse, I can even run uh, integration tests on top of my application to make sure that everything runs the way it was supposed to before promoting that to production. And, you know, I have a manual approval because I, I don't want to disrupt anything that happens in production. But you can create a single pipeline that does exactly, you know, everything you need to, and that integrates really well, including managing the whole back, you know, out with, with CloudFormation and, you know, giving all the details you need to know seamlessly out of the box. And it costs $1 per month, so please use it. Yeah, use it. I, uh, I wish I could say anything else than that, but use it. Uh, and all scaling group. How many of you use all scaling group? That's the, the best one. Come on, we need more hands. Okay. Lie to me and everyone will raise your hand and say, oh, I use all scaling group. Okay, that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. The reality is the following Does anyone not know what all scaling group does? No? Okay, good. So. For those of you who actually use it, answer the question, do you use simple, raise your hand if you use the simple scaling policy? Step scaling policy? Target is scaling policy? If you don't know which policy you're using? <laughs> okay, okay, that, 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 that's a fair point. I have my personal favorite, which is you know step scaling for the wing, but the target one is actually pretty good. Well, we can talk about that after you know after the presentation. But they're all different and very important. Um, but basically, the gist of it is you have a service that keeps analyzing the metrics of your uh, overall system, and depending whether or not it crosses the threshold upwards or backwards, uh, it will scale out or shrink the number of instances you have, and you have the control of deciding you know how many you, you, you want to have, what's the desired capacity, and how, you know, how many you want to have in total, right? So that's the gist of it. And without that, it's gonna be impossible to do, <coughs> to do that. But there is one feature on the old scaling policy, oh sorry, old scaling group, which you also need to really pay attention to. 
because it, it plays along with the, that cloud formation update policy that I told you. So you can choose one thing called termination policy. And there are many, but the ones that I believe are relevant are the oldest launch template or oldest launch configuration, which is basically the thing we're creating on, on CloudFormation and say, this is how you launch a new instance. And uh, when you specify that, when the CloudFormation needs to remove an instance, it will remove an instance which contains the previous configuration, which may ensures that you are always replacing an old instance, unpatched instance, with a patched one. So you see, they have to play in harmony with one another. And there is the oldest instance, which is usually useful for when you're changing the instance type, but when you're patching, is essentially you're going to be hitting the same spot. So, yep, there are many other combinations. You can specify more than one. Please, please play with that. That's fantastic. And let's put everything together, because so far everything has been, you know, really up in the air. So I think that right now it comes, you know, the good stuff. So patching strategies for stateless workload types, which is you don't retain state in your system, so it doesn't lose data per se, it's usually slightly, you know, simpler, but that doesn't mean it's going to be simple. It's going to be interesting, all right? So you got the patched EMI, regardless of which service you're using, and somehow you got that to trigger the code pipeline. That doesn't mean that they trigger, they, they communicate, they integrate with one another, but you can do that by scheduling, you can do that with a Lambda function, you can do that with so many different ways. So I really don't care which way you choose, but I care that at a certain point, you trigger the code pipeline. The code pipeline will, will because of its integration, will trigger the CloudFormation deployment. And as you've seen before, the CloudFormation deployment only handles two big resources, launch configuration or launch templates, and uh, in the all scaling group, all right? Does every, do everyone remember, sorry, does everyone remember that? Sweet, okay. So this is what we do, but that, that's where things get slightly interesting. When we change one of those resources, there will be ramifications and things that will change in our architecture that can impact us. So I will basically paint the whole picture so we can see how things play together. So in that little box, I'm basically adding everything that's controlled by CloudFormation, even though I'm not creating the instance in the CloudFormation. There, there's no you know, resource ID here. It's created by the OSCAN group, but it's, it is part of the CloudFormation responsibility, all right? And to make sure that there is no zero downtime, we have a load balancer which will be checking whether the instances are healthy, healthy and in case they are, traffic will be sent to them. In case they are not, traffic at you know that instance will not be considered as healthy, and no traffic will be sent to them. And if essentially, uh, all scaling will remove that later later on. That's another piece of configuration that must be in you know in agreement with everything else. And the user is accessing the load balancer. All right, sweet. So the first thing that will happen is uh, the cloud formation will create a new template. And that precisely explains why launch configuration and launch templates are immutable. If you want to change an AMI ID, you will create a new one. You cannot change the one that exists. And if you ever wondered why, that's probably the reason why. Uh, and when it does that, assuming that your old scaling policy has that termination policy that removes the oldest launch configuration instances first, what it will do, it will replace the old instance with a new one, which is identified by this little you know, light bulb. Um, there is one thing that we can do here, and it's really benefit. You're not required to, but you're highly recommended to use this strategy. So when you're using CloudFormation, there is one framework called CloudFormation signals, or resource signals, in which you, after the instance boots up, you can send a request to CloudFormation saying, oh, you know this resource that you were talking about? Uh-huh, that's all good, keep going. Because if that doesn't happen, CloudFormation, within you know, a, a timeout you defined, CloudFormation will consider that as a failure, and only with that, it will try to roll back to the previous state. So in case this happens, in case this fails, the, the new launch uh, template will be deleted, and everything will be reverted to the previous state. And of course, there will be this 
connectivity between a uh, load balancer and the old instance in which you will first check if the instance is you know healthy and replying to the health check endpoint before you can send human uh, you know user traffic to that. But in the meantime, the application really didn't suffered an outage because when you are registering, you know, deregistering one of the instances to replace with the previous one, it drains the connections out of that one. And only after that, the, the, the old scaling group will actually replace that with a new one. So when you put all of those little subtities together, you get an, a, a zero downtime deployment. But you're not here to talk about the you know, unhappy path. Let's talk about the happy path. They are usually more interesting. So after this actually signals um, uh, CloudFormation that it worked out, it will try to do the same for the other instance, but not, not only, sorry, not, uh, um, not unless this one isn't receiving traffic. And why do, how do you ensure that? You have timeouts in here, you have timeouts in here, you have timeouts in here, you have timeouts in here. All of them must be aligned. If you miss one of them, things will not work, and to make things worse, their logging capabilities is not the best one. It's going to be hard for you to identify what went wrong, right? So, if anything goes wrong, this is why. So you replace the new instance, everyone is happy. Yeah, essentially, it needs to delete the old, the old, the old one before. Okay, it's like I, I believe that this is like playing Jenga, right? In, in, in a way, you have to remove pieces very, you know, carefully, and there is an order that you have to do that to maintain this structure. But there is one thing which is different from, from you know, from Jenga. In Jenga, when you know, the whole tower, tower actually falls, the person who actually caused that to, you know, to fall is upset and everyone else is clearly happy. But in the real life, when you try to do OS patching and you know, the whole thing, the whole architecture falls apart, you are desperate and everyone else is furious at you. So <laughs> I think that's the only big difference between Jenga and OS patching. So be aware of that. Be aware of that. But what about stateful workloads? Okay. You, we all know the answer to that. It is significantly harder than stateless because if you are replicating data asynchronously, there is a difference between the time that you are, which is T, and what's the latest thing you have, you know, replicated to, you know, the, to the second node, to the passive node, active node, slave node, whatever name you want to use. There is a delta, and that delta is clearly data loss, can lead to data corruption, can lead to you know, inaccurate results. No one wants that. There's no surprise that everyone wants to develop stateless applications. But there is a problem. For you to be stateless, somebody else's application must be stateful. If everything is completely stateless, your application is irrelevant. You can only build a calculator at most, right? <laughs> so eventually, you have to figure out a way of patching your stateful applications. And here's where the problem comes. We only have you know, a few more minutes before this presentation is over. I'm not gonna be able to tell you all the different strategies, because, most likely because first, I don't know all the strategies, and second, because it's really specific to each you know, architect type. But I can show you one example, which is the RDS patching, which is a good example, is what we use, you know, and we use database uh, every single day. And uh, we can talk about you know, the nuances there or how to solve that. Uh, but if your replication is, we talked about how hard it is for asynchronous, but if your application is synchronous, you cannot scale linearly. That's, you, it's hard to choose between two options when both are bad. Let's be honest. And uh, it's like you know the cap theorem. You don't you don't want to choose any of them. None of them actually is good. Even though the cap theorem is a bit more of guidelines. But the thing is, this is the takeaway from this slide. Most people that I've talked to, they believe that this data loss can be chucked into the RPO and RTO. This is clearly a mistake. You can get away with that legally speaking because no one can sue you with that. But this. Clearly not the right way of doing that. Please don't do that. Please. Okay? This is meant to be used for disaster recovery. Alright? So, how does AWS do that? Um, I want to show how, you know, the RDS one is done. And uh, 
probably you have a few questions or probably disagree with me. But I like that one. So you, how many of you have seen that one? Yeah, it's definitely on all the, the uh, AWS 101 presentations. It's the, the famous shared responsibility model, which means that anything that goes wrong, it's above software, is your fault. <laughs> I hate that. But in the case of fully managed services, AWS is responsible for at least that layer. And it varies from you know service to service. But in case of your RDS, they are responsible for patching. That's precisely the reason why they force you to choose a maintenance window when you create the, the, the RDS instance. So here's the thing. And I used all my you know, uh, PPT presentation skills on that one. So please let me know if that's not, not, not good enough, all right? So we have a DNS resolution, whatever that is, that points to the active instance of my RDS. And that RDS, it is on the multi-AZ you know, scheme. So that's all good. There is a mistake that most people actually make when you know, trying to create the idea of, hey, how does AWS does a replication? They're not going to have an army of people evaluating you know, whether the, the, the delta is close to zero. Makes no sense. It doesn't scale well, especially for the price it costs. It doesn't scale well. And the reason for that is because a lot of people that go to the cloud, they used to do replication via the database engine but that's a synchronous replication, which is wrong. RDS does not use a synchronous replication between, and that's really important, between the active and standby. If you're talking about active and read replica, then it, it does use, but that's not what we're talking about. That's really important that you guys know that. So it helps to see this particular design not only as a service, but as a machine and a disk. Because in a disk, you can do one thing called synchronous replication. Does anyone know a technology name called DRDB? Sweet, nice. That, that, that's a very old one. And if you don't know, you'll get it straight away. First, what, what it does is it gets a, a copy of the, you know, the, the changes on the block level. The hardware level, you know, the, the, blo the block size goes to the disk. But before it returns, it basically does a replication to another machine, and then it returns to the operating system. So it's basically transparent. It does take you know, a lot of questions, like, come on, that's going to make everything much, much slower, right? And yes, you're right, up to a certain point. But the funny thing, or the interesting thing is, have you heard, any, have you heard anyone lately, or at least today, complaining about how Kubernetes is, you know, cumbersome, difficult to manage, and probably not something useful for anything that people are doing? Yeah, there you go, we all think that. But, in the case of um, the RDB, in the past, we used, to, you know, bef before the cloud days, we used to have one thing called Linux High Availability, which was Paxos, the RDB, and another, another technology, which it doesn't, you know, is irrelevant at this point. But one is for doing the replication, the other one is also, is also you know, for replicating at the block level. <laughs> that was hard. That was the Kubernetes, you know, from, you know, from the old days, because everyone complained about that, but everyone needed to use that, exactly like we do with Kubernetes nowadays. But it is a very powerful, uh, you know, technique, if, and only if, you are in control of everything in between. In the case of AWS, they control the data centers, they control the, you know, the network, they can ensure that things will not get congested at the, the network level because they can create separate channels of network connectivity specifically for that. So that's much simpler. I'm not saying that you know, it's take, so take it for granted, but it's much simpler when you, you, you don't have to compete against somebody else's request. So getting this out of the way, the first thing that will happen is uh, nothing will change to the customer, but these instances will be patched and rebooted. So at a certain point, the replication here will be broken. It needs to come to, you know, to the delta equals to zero, right? And after it does, there is a failover, and this failover is done at the, the DNS level. So of course there is a configuration change, but it's important that you know that because this is done synchronously, it goes between one data center and another and then comes back, the data loss is zero. So as close as you can get to zero, right? Because you're not, you're not, you're not buffering data, you're not waiting for your opportunity to access the disk, and it's done before 
you know, the, 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 the response is actually, you know, given back to the user. And if you are, and that's a reasonable, you know, objection, but if you are concerned about, hang on, Paula, but if that's true, then RDS must be really, really slow. I can tell you it's not, but I want you to hold that thought. I, I, I like that type of, you know, disagreement. It's going to be important for you. So, this one becomes active, the other one becomes standby. And after this whole thing is done, we invert the replication you know, uh, direction. Because during the patch of the previous active one, this one can receive traffic, right? And can receive new data. When you switch it back, you, you, you don't want that to be lost. You really don't, right? So essentially, after this happens, we move back to the normal, right? What is arguable is whether they simply do the failover once and change the synchronous replication, or if they change it twice. I wish I could tell you. My NDA cannot, can, does not allow me to say that, but I'm not prohibited, I'm not forbidden to, you know, put the question in the air and let you guys come that con to that conclusion, because it's pretty obvious, let's be honest, right? All right, so synchronous replication. I sincerely don't buy it. It must make things really slow. Okay, you're right. It should. But let's revisit the definition of um, availability zones and also let's use another thing that we can observe to basically question whether or not our train of thought is actually right. So does anyone not know what DynamoDB is? Okay? No? Okay. So DynamoDB is, the, 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 the first sentence that you, you will find when you Google DynamoDB is, it provides access to data with a single digit of millisecond of latency. Right? Remember that? Sweet. So a single digit of millisecond can be bet between one and nine, because two is you know, two digits. But what if we use that to make this you know, thought experiment? The AZs are supposed to be isolated from one another to withstand a failure or a natural failure that can impact one data center to the point that you don't lose data. All right? That's not a guarantee. That's a design strategy. It's like what we do for you know the airline industry. So in the past there used to be two people in the cabin, but then there was that guy who actually you know you know locked the other one out and you drove you drove the, the aircraft into a mountain, and now there are three. So we keep evolving in terms of designing of how to do things better, right? But we know that the current design is aimed to withstand a natural failure. So let's use one as an example. So in one millisecond, which is one, the, the best case scenario of uh, the speed of light, and I know fiber optics is not a speed of light, but it's just to make the calculation faster, all right? It can travel up to 300 kilometers. You can multiply that by nine and see what's the biggest possible distance between two data centers. All right? You can apply, you know, the real the real speed later on. We can get one particular natural disaster, like this one. That's the Gulf of Mexico. Apparently, this is the one that uh, initiated the, the mass extinction during, you know, one of one of one of the periods where all the dinosaurs, you know, went to custards, or seventy five percent of life on Earth went to custard. That crater is surprisingly 150 kilometers. So if you have one data center that in the best case scenario oh, is 300 kilometers apart from that, that's good enough because that one will create more problems than I want you to have already, right? We can all be happy. You know, we're all going to die, but you know, the data will be safe. But it's a different discussion now. And regarding the speed of light for fiber is exactly 61%. Oh, sorry, 69% of the speed of light. So you can get that, that calculation just multiply by 0 0.69 and you're going to get you know, the, the real distance. So the other, unless you go to weak leaks and see the, you know, the data center's location, but uh, uh, you, 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 the AWS will not tell you the distance, but we can infer that with a good, reason, a good amount of you know, accuracy. But one millisecond, which is the important part, is too close to a microsecond. 
It's just like, literally, it's very close to microseconds. So if you say that one millisecond is too much for your application to extend, like, oh, I cannot lose one microsecond, I have terrible news for you, but it's good for 99.99% of applications out there, even if that replication is synchronous. So that's the way they actually apply uh, patching with zero downtime for a stateful system. So that's one strategy. Of course, there are others, specifically when it comes to partitions, when it comes to sharding. There are so many different other ways you can do it, but it would take me you know, a longer time. In the case of Lambda, I didn't put the slides together because I'm probably running out of time, but remember the one we did together for stateless? Try to imagine that with a lot of instances. You have to phase out them and do that probably, you know, throughout the month because you have so many instances. You, you can't really simply, you know, wait for one time to do everything at once. You can't do it. You don't have enough, you know, machine spare capacity out there. So they have to do that in a rolling deployment uh, phase. So the way you can know how often does your Lambda actually needs to be patched, it's very simple. Uh, create a Lambda function and try to read the uptime value of the of your operating system and ping that every second probably not going to cost you anything at the end of the month but you will come to a number which is reasonably small but very interesting nonetheless right and with that i think i'll open for a q a, q &A session thank you very much <laughs> all right questions Question. Yes, sure. Um, live kernel patches. Mm -hmm. You know, you said Amazon Linux can do it, right? How do you exactly do it? Like turn on live kernel cache patching. Mm -hmm. So the, the way you show us in there, uh, you still patch the my change launch conversion, which basically turn off the easy to access, right? So that's not live kernel patching, is it? No, the, 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 when you create a new, you know, AMI because you have to replace yeah, yeah. the system, yeah. it's the equivalent of rebooting, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so the so. kernel of patching is when there is no deployment per se. You just really apply the patch. So the patch is is written in C, you know, and it's compiled as if it was a kernel module. So the kernel has this ability of actually loading yeah. dynamically uh, modules. So they use the same channel. Yeah. So can you um, use like system managers to manage those patches or some other way? You can use Yum, for instance. Yum, yeah, and on the case of Amazon Linux, you can en enable the search and the the, 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 the commands to run on oh, sorry. Uh, the commands and, 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 and the search on at the Yum level and say I want whenever I say Yum update, I want you to bring kernel live uh, patches as options and you can right. choose which you want to patch and in the case, let's use Yum as an example. So, RPM, Debian, they're all z glamorized zip files, right? But the difference between them and the zip file is that they contain what is called scriptlets. And the scriptlets will basically tell a life cycle saying, look, if you are about to install this particular package, I want to execute this shell bash script. So, in this bash script that, that um, AWS will, you know, will give you as part of the package that you are allowed to, to patch, uh, it will basically you know, run all the commands in these two sure. so you don't have to hassle, right? So basically, if I want to do that, I still do it through SSM agents? Like, you can do that yeah. through the SSM agent. And, so they manage it, and when they apply it, uh, even if it requires rebooting, mm -hmm. I can just let it. Yeah, it won't do repack, it won't necessarily repack. Reboot if it's compatible, right? And, like within three months. Okay. So, yeah. No, it's not going to reboot automatically yeah. unless it has to, like, there is an underlying hardware yeah. failure. But, um, yeah, um, maybe it's because I'm risk averse, but <laughs> use that as the last option, the last resort. Yeah, right? yeah, of course. Yeah, like, you know, another meltdown in Spectrum was released, and then, you know, okay, I have to use it. But apart from that, you know, just go through um, these other ways of doing patching because. When you change your application and you change the process in your company to actually get to that level where you can do with zero downtime patching, everything else that's required to take you there will have to be improved and you can use even more interesting things like spot instances or you know things which will take you to a better place. So yeah, go, yeah, yeah, go that best you can. Yeah, yeah, I mean, at least like, you know, live caching is interesting and you know, it's, it's a nice option to mm -hmm. have if you run out of options. Oh, definitely, definitely.
Yeah. And, and uh, I mean, the other benefit of this is not just, you know, um, because the patch could contain anything you want, right? So mm -hmm. it can include like just data update as well if you need to. It can. Um, the kernel app, the kernel live patching framework. If you read the, the source code on, 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 on the Linux kernel, it has hooks in which allows you to basically, you know, take care of memory, with, you know, data memory that's out there. So you can apply different processes of how to handle whether you're dealing with the new way or the old way, but it increases the complexity exponentially. So the person who actually crafted that um, patch for you. Of course, they went through a very rigorously, you know, big process to verify that before shipping that to you. But that doesn't mean that the person was able to test everything. So, the more it gets to that level, the bigger the risk also will be. Yeah. Yeah, I know, I know. The, the lesson here is don't use a lightning. Yes, exactly. Yeah. But it's possible. And it is possible, and it feels like magic. The first time you actually do the first one, it's like, whoa! That, that, that's really yeah, amazing. Really I mean, maybe if it can do a lot of other things as well. Uh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's something that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Any other questions, guys? Before we close it. Oh, thank you. Yes. Is there a Windows Windows Windows? I'm gonna be honest. I don't know. I have I haven't used Windows for for a little while. No prejudice. Though. Don't get me wrong. It's just I don't know because uh, they are. They're not really open about you know things that, that they do and how they do it. Uh, there must be ways of you know knowing that. But in the case of, of the kernel, we basically read the code, read the docs. It's, it's a bit easier to you know answer all the questions. But I don't know. I hope so. I don't know. <laughs> if anyone knows, please answer that. I don't. <laughs> so any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Uh, just now the live kernel patching that you. You mentioned just now in the slide. You mentioned that this is applicable for Amazon Linux AMI only, or what if the other Linux AMI such as Ubuntu does they do they have actually the live kernel patching also, which yeah. have uh -huh. which able to uh, have features of delay delay reboot? God, very good question. I think that it's possible. I'm not saying that I would do that, but it's possible that the same patch for the same kernel version that is released by AWS, if you get that, remove all the scriptlets, you know, get just the code, compile yourself and put that in another distro, that it could work. I just wouldn't try that, right? But the kernel is essentially the same, but some distros actually apply their own versions of, you know, patches, which is a little bit away from the mainstream kernel, and because of that, you know, the, even though they're all in this kernel, they are slightly different from one another, so the risk of actually things failing increase a little bit more. So for those other distros, maybe, maybe you should pay for, for, you know, for their kernel developers to actually, you know, write that. Yes? You have to be careful with things like preemptive kernels, which are different. Ooh, it's different a different game. Like some, the, some things like uh, you know, some kernels, mm -hmm. just have some you know, things. Wouldn't want to transfer over a live page. Oh, definitely, definitely. It's it's yeah. it's really a, it's a big beast. Mm -hmm. it's a, do you do you use preemptive kernel or like on a, on, a, on, a, on a daily basis? Oh yeah, on the desktop. Oh I'm no. Just joking, I'm just joking. Just for fun. Then we'll just, then we'll just you're a brave. You're a brave person. I, I still haven't used that. Like I, I know what it is. I have played with that, but no. What is it? <laughs> I kind of do it. What is the preemptive? Okay, so the preemptive, preemptive kernel is a, um, how can I explain that in, in, in simple terms? You, your task can be preempted and all the tasks can take place at a slightly more frequent time than you would get if you're not using a preemptive, preemptive one. So there are a lot of um, concerns about locking mechanisms that changes the way you program your, your, your kernel when you want to ensure that the kernel cannot stop doing what it's doing to do something else because you get the lock of the CPU. So that's, that's aimed to turn the, 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 the Linux kernel experience into kind of like a more real-time-like, as, as close as it can get to a real-time-like operating system, but it's still ages, light years behind, you know, proper uh, um, uh, real-time kernels out there. So, yeah. 
All right. Uh, any other question? Yes, sure. Uh, you mentioned the way of the patching going via pipelines and so on via AMOS. Yes. What are your thoughts on this? Ah, oh, it's fantastic. I, I love that one. I think that the the other the only thing I wouldn't the only reason why I use code pipeline on that particular case is because if you are using if you're trying to trigger that type of mechanism through SSN, your instance will have to have access to all of those services that maybe you don't want your instance to have access to. Right. So it's like a, a separation of concerns. If the pipeline has you know writing permissions to change the, the old scaling group, then it's completely separate from you know, from from uh, you know the role that's attached to the to, to the machine. Because otherwise, if someone you know eventually gets access to, to your machine, the privilege that they can explore is you know is a bit more. But it, it is possible. If the question is, it is possible to do that via SSM? Yes, it is. Can you do all of that with code pipeline and yet use SSM? Because you know after the, the patching, you can still log into the machine. Uh, via the SSM agent, yes, you you can do that. They are not mo mutually exclusive. They can be either you know combined or used separately. Can yeah. I just add something to SSM? Yeah, please, please. Like by using SSM and using SSM inheritance agent in that way, you're basically creating a you know a mutable infrastructure. So potentially you can put in you know like. We now know that you know we want more cattles and not pets, right? Yes. By using SSMs, you essentially are petting you know, those servers. So um, if you're using code pipelines, then you know what exactly goes in. It's been goes through all the environments mm -hmm. and they're all you know being tested and you can rely on that. Sure. Um, and also, you know, your application also needs to do that too. That your application actually work with these patches by going through the environment, mm -hmm. you actually know, right? Sure. But with SSA applying, you don't necessarily know for sure because of all those other changes that potentially is there that you don't know about, right? Sure. Yeah, no, makes perfect so. sense. All right, guys, I'm not going to keep you from the last beer, and also I don't want you guys to keep me from my last beer. It's still so <laughs> um, one last thing is um, every now and then I write stuff. On, uh, on, uh, on Medium and also on the organizing of, uh, of uh, Auckland Data Structures and Algorithms uh, Meetup Group, which I help people getting you know prepared for interviews at you know Facebook, Amazon, Google, and stuff because of you know the coding uh, challenge. So you can either find me there if you like the subject, and uh, in case you like the stuff you know I write about, it's usually this storytelling, investigation like technology stuff. I will post the link of my uh, blog on the on on the Getica's group. If you guys can, you know, probably, you know, hit follow, it would mean a lot to me. All right. Thank you very much for your time. It was a pleasure talking to you. You guys are cool.